This video was produced by... Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm glad that we have such a great turnout. I was asking some of the folks that are on the planning committee how many uh, institutions are represented here, and she uh, is interested in counting that after the, after the process is over with, but I'm, I'm glad to see a number of people from a number of different institutions here, and welcome again. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today our keynote speaker, Jeffrey Young. Jeffrey is the senior editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, and focuses on uh, educational technology and, and the future of technology uh, within higher education. Uh, he also serves as an adjunct professor of journalism at the University of Maryland at College Park, teaching a course on multimedia storytelling. He has a wife, Leah, and two young children. Uh, he joked that uh, his kids teach him about new technology uh, all the time, and that, that actually uh, highlights a really important point uh, about having workshops such as this, having conferences such as this, uh, and being aware of how technology is changing, and not just how technology is changing, but how generations change. So I have a six-year-old son uh, as well, and a couple of years ago when he was two, my son could not understand why the TV didn't swipe. So we have, we have a generation of students that are going to be coming up in a few years whose expectation beyond that of even the millennials that we currently have is for interactivity and engagement. Uh, we had some consultants on campus last week that were talking about the generation that's coming after the millennials. And this is a generation of students that is defined by 9-11 and economic collapse and climate change. These are students for which Violence on campus is a weekly occurrence, so safety is a major issue. So not only do we have to stay aware of how technology changes and what implications it has for how we teach, we also have to be aware of the changes in the, in the, the, the defining moments of the generations that we work with to understand how they interact with technology. So thank you again for joining us. I'm excited to hear the presentation today by Jeffrey, uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, and it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I want to start off talking about something that probably doesn't come up in, uh, you know, at, at conferences with esteemed professors and, and higher ed folks like yourself, and that um, topic is unicorns. Now, of course, these are mythical creatures with, um, you know, horses with horns. We talked about little kids. Little kids love them. But um, this is something that um, I bring up because I'm sure you guys would guess that in Silicon Valley, these are actually something that people talk about um, with a straight face um, about actually the kind of gold standard. Um, if, if the actual unicorn or mythical unicorn is a, a, something that only the virtuous can, can see, then the idea is that um, in Silicon Valley, it's got a very specific definition. It's companies that have a billion dollars in, val in valuation, which of course this is all kind of in the, in the air money, right? But based on the investment that it's got in the early stages of, of um, these venture capital investments. And so, you know, you want, you want to, to see a unicorn. Um, and of course, there are unicorns in Silicon Valley. In fact, this uh, Fortune magazine did a analysis this year, found 80, this used to be sort of a rare thing, but 80, well, I guess it's still pretty rare. Um, 80 companies, I, I, ex I expect you can't see all the names, sorry for the size, but I do want to kind of emphasize the, um, the amount of money journalists like to follow the money. Um, there's plenty of it in technology these days, you guys all know that. And these companies, of course, are ones we're all familiar with as far as um, relatively new, but you hear about them every day. Like Uber is one of the largest in, on here um, at around 41 um, $41 billion in valuation. A lot of companies that I hadn't even heard of, some of them, um, though, are like Snapchat, and a lot of platforms, of course, like Airbnb. Um, these, are, um, these are the companies that are the unicorns. And of course, I bring up unicorns and, and, and well, money, because we follow the money, but unicorns because it just reminds us that there's this language within Silicon Valley um, that might seem to an outsider um, kind of odd or strange or even goofy, um, but to the insiders is used uh, actually very seriously. But you guys are also in a world where people uh, ascribe to you and, and you probably actually have some language of your own in the academy that other people outside of the academy see as possibly just as foreign 
Um, and the Ivory Tower, this, um, you know, in a way, mythical name for what higher education is. And I guess we all, I'm sure you guys, from covering higher ed for a long time at the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, the, of course, the, the misconceptions are many about the ivory tower, right? In a way, this has been a popular, this is actually an actual tower at Princeton University's graduate school, which um, is one, which one of the icons that was first referred to when this image was used. Uh, and, and it really grew to prominence in the, um, it, it basically this century over um, looking at the, the academy as sort of off on its own. Ivory, of course, being this most precious of objects and the tower, being kind of up above and outside of, of the world. But I, I have a feeling, and actually, let me get a show of hands. I mean, how many people that are in this room kind of perceive themselves as working off in some magical land far from the world? Oh, yeah, maybe one or two, but, um, but you know, this is, this is not, you know, th th there are misconceptions about what happens in the ivory tower, and there's probably no ivory tower and yet there are certain reasons why um, there are certain language and mindsets that are unique to higher education. And so um, the same thing about um, there are misconceptions as well about Silicon Valley and the, the simple truths about you know, the money as keeping score um, is certainly happens in, in business, but it's not the only reason that people I've talked to who work in these startups are doing it. You know, and, and in this room, I'm sure that's not a hard sell. But um, so I wanted to talk today. Um, so in a way, if this were an HBO series, it'd be the Unicorn and the Tower, and we'd be like the next Game of Thrones. But so I probably should have named it that instead of the title I did pick. But I was referring to this. You know, I think still kind of known to people book, even though it's been many decades, of uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, I'm getting some head nods. So this book, which the, the point of it, uh, in a nutshell, um, it, it is basically this practical guide for saying that, the, that men and women have different ways of seeing the world. There's different mindsets and language, and that better understanding each other would benefit us all, because we all live in a world where men and women are are going to interact, and so um, this was this was this popular book. So I guess the um, to, to give a very concrete example, um, just actually in the last couple of weeks, there was an article that that a, a piece that ran on NPR, National Public Radio, and they quoted um, Jose Ferreira, who is the CEO of a company called Newton, which is actually um, and of course. Newton is at the center of one of the biggest trends in teaching and learning right now, which is adaptive learning or um, you know, learning analytics data um, to make the learning process you know, it's kind of the next level. And so he had this quote on the show when he was interviewed. He said, we think of it like a robot tutor in the sky. Um, you know, this is, this is good sci-fi, right? They can semi-read your mind and figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are down to the percentile. So, you know, he is selling his product. This is somebody who wants to be a unicorn. I didn't actually, or, you know, I didn't ask him this question. I ask a lot of business people, do you want to be a unicorn? And they all like laugh and they're like nervous because it's like the academy doesn't want to talk about unicorns, so they know that. But, um, but they, of course, like who doesn't want to win the game? Um, so um, somebody in the academy, um, or at least somebody consulting, Michael Feldstein, who writes the blog Illiterate, which is, uh, which is a really great blog if people don't know it already, but he started off as an administrator within higher ed. He knows the language of higher ed well. Um, and he, got, he reacted to this quote and others like it, and actually kind of accused um, the, the CEO of Newton of being kind of a snake oil salesman. He used the word snake oil, which always gets um, you know, uh, fighting words, right? So the journalists like me, go, oh, what is he saying? But he argues that this kind of language is not helpful in, um, how, in trying to have a product that folks, professors, and people who support professors would use. Um, and he says this is quasi-mystical garbage. Um, and that he hurts its brand because if you, he says, if you want to sell me a product, um, you know, just tell me in straightforward language what it does. Like, don't give me all this um, robot tutor in the sky and the, you know, the unicorn stuff. And so there's this, I, there's this notion in the air right now of that buzzwords are kind of stifling or could stifle innovation in higher education. That the, the you know, market or the, the tribe or the, you know, the space of college learning is not the place 
that, that maybe it works in other fields, but that somehow the language that's been used and worked for other unicorns in Silicon Valley may not be appropriate or may not be effective and could actually stifle the adoption when professors just kind of see skeptically um, these, um, these kind of sales pitches. Um, so recently we did, a little, um, we did a little fun quiz on our website where we asked, we asked readers, and we have readers obviously some of which are pro professors, some of which are supporting professors, and some of which are at these companies, how do you define something like adaptive learning? Um, and not surprisingly, it was all over the map. Um, but a lot of people used it as a kind of space for commentary and skepticism, um, like small lizards adapt to their surroundings by changing color. Um, there was, um, you know, and some people were genuinely trying to understand it and not necessarily making fun of it. And then we asked also about flipped classrooms. And again, we see often, and I, <laughs> I talk to a lot of professors, not just ones at, at groups like this, where I assume people are you know, already trying things and really, you know, or supporting technology, so it's not a sales pitch to tell you guys that, that it's interesting. But there are a lot of professors still when I go to campuses that are, especially I'm not at a technology event per se, where people are quite skeptical of what's going on and what we're writing about and what you guys may be even up to. Um, you know, so this, this idea comes through in, in a very quippy quote like this. Um, uh, so, um, an idiotic assumption that teaching has only worked a single way up until now, and some genius white dude saw the student watch an Indian guy's video. So I think they're referring to um, Sal Khan giving his TED talk that was famous. And so, you know, there's this, these are, these are definitely a sign of something out there that's, um, that's a, a, a vibe that still persists within higher education. But um, now to, to be the, the person that I am, where I'm the journalist getting to watch all this from the sidelines, really, um, I can say that we also cover a lot of criticism of the Academy's language. And this was a piece by Steven Pinker, a noted scholar at Harvard. But he wrote this piece for us in the past year where he talked about, um, it's actually a really interesting article because, you know, there's this kind of, it's kind of almost like a lazy thing to like, oh, academics can't write, and there's their journal article. You just quote from a journal article, and it's pretty easy, right? It's kind of fun to pick out uh, stilted phrasings and jargon. And, and so, but he actually goes a little farther and kind of says, well, why is this happening? And he doesn't say that professors are bad writers or bad people or just not smart enough to write or anything. In fact, he tries to, you know, make sure we disabuse your notion of that. But it, the idea is that there's something within, um, there's something within the culture of higher education where the most important audience are the very select few in someone's discipline that are reading this. And for those people, that's who you're posturing to when you're writing a scholarly article in a esteemed peer review journal. Not that, and you know your audience. You're gonna write for your audience, right, if you're smart. And because you are smart, you're writing in this kind of jargony way. And he, did, he actually was analyzing some papers and he was saying, He's like, in my own field, I sometimes don't understand it. It's not that they're using jargon. They're using language to try to really make it sure that they're sounding like they're doing it right, that they're using this kind of formal, very kind of serious language. And he says that this is cultural and could be changed. So um, the, I recently went to a um, conference. It was actually just a couple months ago about the future of adaptive learning. And Richard Collada, who is the... Um, uh, let me get his name right, the uh, title right, the Director of the Office of Education Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. And he actually, um, it's, it actually really got me thinking about this even more, this whole topic of language and mindset, because he raised it as a big barrier. He kind of did make the, the case that um, language is becoming a barrier to adoption of these technologies. And he's, he's calling for clear language on both sides when we talk about teaching with technology in various new stripes. And I thought his examples that he um, showed at that talk um, were really interesting. So it's basically trying to say that, yes, you know, adaptive learning, but there's also kind of fine gradations underneath the different kind of ways that you can use big data or that you can use some of these new techniques. So he talks about competency-based learning, which of course is another big buzzword these days, um, and actual, you know, not just a buzzword, but people trying it. Um, so he says, you know, it boils it down to as few words as he could, you move when you show you can do. And so instead of seat time, uh, a kind of based on um, showing you can, you, you can do something. Adaptive learning, he defines, and this is kind of the broad category of technology assigns educational resources. So in other words, you're in the midst of something and the technology is going to help decide what's next. Um, but within that, he talks about individualized learning, which adjusts pace, versus, say, like personalized learning, which he defines as 
pace approach and adding student agency. So the, um, you know, trying to get it beyond the kind of um, robot tutor or sort of like a spaceship in the sky. Um, so obviously this kind of talk maybe I could have given years ago. Um, maybe some of you are already wondering like, well, yeah, we know this. We know that um, the language of um, Silicon Valley and the language of the Academy is different. But there's something different. There's a moment right now, I think, and this is actually maybe the, the, one of the big points I wanna, um, I wanna have today is that we're sort of at an interesting kind of moment in technology in higher education. Um, and I think that this language is more important than ever in understanding the other side on both sides. Um, before, obviously, there was, there was uh, a lot of learning technology. I've heard there are, you know, somebody was telling me about the, some of the amazing rooms, smart classrooms and facilities on this campus. And I, there are at ever, a lot of campuses I visit. But a lot of the early technology, um, and of course we're moving beyond this, was, was kind of taking the presentation tools, like the one I'm using right here and was, uh, was having trouble myself with at the beginning, um, was basically taking slides, transparencies, and turning them into something that you could display digitally. And so it didn't really change the kind of culture of teaching or, um, and it still left the professor kind of as the solo agent in the classroom um, with some support, of course. But the, um, and of course it did allow, having the slides digital, this is actually no small thing, and having lecture capture, which lets people almost like, you know, DVR so your students can watch it again later. Um, it's been a really important tool. Having, of course, like learning management systems where you can put the slides up afterwards, this has all been really helpful so students don't have to write down every, every word. And so there are changes that came into place, some important ones with this technology investment by colleges. But now we're talking about something um, something different and different metaphors with adaptive learning and some of this data that people are starting to experiment with. And really, when you get to a stage where you can have the professor having this kind of matrix view overlay of what's going on in the heads of the students or where they're at, that um, this is um, from an article we ran not too long ago about Eric Mazur at Harvard, um, the, a physics professor who's been a longtime experimenter with kind of um, learning um, analytics. And so he has this idea where it, meant it incorporates peer learning, which our keynote this morning mentioned as an important thing. But it obviously, it, it looking at using technology, he has, I got to go to his first lecture of the year and uh, of the first, first class session, and it's the only lecture he gives all semester. Um, and then basically it's a lecture about why he shouldn't lecture or why he's not gonna lecture anymore. Um, so it's, it's actually very articulate and it's, it's an amazing lecture, but then you're like, this is the only lecture you're gonna get is this class. And then the rest of the time people are on their laptops or on computers going through this learning software, learning um, that, that is adapting to them. And he can see as they go who's where, and he can pair students up into groups based on, you know, with somebody who understands it and somebody who doesn't understand it, and they teach each other, so that you have this idea of one-on-one -on -one teaching even though it's a big room full of 50 students. And so um, that kind of overlay requires a very different relationship between the software makers and the, and the professors. And, um, and so these, this kind of, we're in this era of dashboards and this is Sal Khan, who um, is one of these innovators, and he has been working with Khan Academy, which I'm sure people have heard of. A lot of his work on the ground has been with K-12 schools, but it certainly could and, and is being done by other people adapting to colleges as well. But the idea, even if you're doing a, a lecture model, even if you don't have learning software doing all the work of your class, if you're not that far, then even for a lecture, you could have a, a dashboard that kind of shows where the student has, you know, did they watch the video? Did they go through X amount of the textbook that was assigned? Or did they, or even just to remind you as the professor of where they are in their, um, maybe they were a remedial student, maybe they're a first generation student, or other kind of information so that even in a large room, you can have this kind of on demand um, knowledge about your students. Um, and so it's the idea of taking this data and um, and having this be a, a real-time thing. It's very different, again, than just having a presentation machine. And so um, flipped classrooms are, of course, one of the things that we write about a lot. I'm sure people are trying it. And I don't really probably have to define it for you guys, but the, the, the ideas are actually a big one for the, for the role of the professor if you actually do it, because there has to be video. Somebody has to make this video. And maybe you can grab it from somewhere else um, in many cases. But you often, you know, professors, are, professors and, and universities are, are making them as well. 
But I've been surprised by how much adoption there is so far, even at this early stage of flipped classrooms. This is from a survey that we wrote about this year from the Gates Foundation. Um, and it, it's, um, there are a lot of numbers on here, I apologize, but I thought it was really interesting that 17% have tried flipped classroom of this survey of professors, and 29% have adopted it. So those are separate numbers. So together, that's um, a lot of people who are really seriously looking or actually trying flipped classrooms. And even more so than some of the other, uh, well, I mean, obviously, some of the non-tech stuff has gotten the, the quicker adoption, like group projects. Um, and this wasn't only about technology and, te and, and teaching, but all kinds of teaching tools. So we're seeing right now, again, as a reporter, we follow the money. We're seeing a boom in the building studios at campuses. Um, at Harvard, they did this big studio, very expensive, in their main Widener library, you know, which I think still has the largest collection in any university in the world of oh, good old-fashioned books. But also, they're right inside of this August building, there's now this nice like TV-style studio, all for teaching and learning. Um, and so I, I don't know what that guy's teaching right there, but, um, but this is something that professors can then make an appointment and use. Now, everyone doesn't have a studio like that, but there is a, um, a boom in some smaller ones too. Penn State has something they call the one button studio. And it's obviously, it's a much kind of more affordable approach. And the idea is to take technology like you guys already have, but set up a space, maybe a couple lights, where it's really, and some support kind of on call, but really so sort of different points on campus. And actually at Penn State, they have 19 of these across the campus set up. So that it's not just this one amazing TV studio where only the one professor gets to do it. The idea is how do how, you know professors and colleges are moving to, well, this is the thing. So like, how do we how do we scale this? How do we get it to be more than just some very special early adopter doing it? And so we're also seeing um, a boom in instructional designers. You can see the advertisements in the Chronicle. You can also, um, when we talk to a lot of people, there are a lot more colleges hiring instructional designers. And we're still looking into this, but uh, you know, one can assume these are being used in, to do more kind of team approach to building a classroom. Because you know, it's, if you are going to have these kind of approaches that require a more personalized for that course, like the physics course I mentioned. It, it can't just be kind of a set up something at the lectern and then assume everyone can go to one training session and it's going to work for everybody. Um, so um, the other thing that I also am really um, stressing in our coverage these days and a point I'd like to make is that there are a lot of people outside of the academy that are doing really interesting things. It gets back to all that the money I was showing floating around. There are a lot of Actually, EdTech investment is at an all-time high. So it's not just the Ubers and the Airbnbs. Um, Silicon Valley investors are putting money into higher education in a way they never have before. And Udacity is probably one of the more well-known ones. Um, I, I'm guessing people have heard of this. The whole, it was part of this whole MOOC um, revolution or, or, or not. But Sebastian Thrun, who started it, is a professor um, of artificial intelligence. And he made this grand claim a couple years ago when he was one of those people that had the mega class with 160,000 signups. And he said that he started Udacity to sort of start these, these open free courses. And his, his argument at the time was, well, he did an interview where he said, in 50 years, there will only be 10 campuses left, and Udacity wants to be one of them. And then he was turning around and trying to work with colleges who were then not so excited to work with someone who they perceived as looking to put them out of business. Um, so he ended up doing something a little different, partly because of his um, big mouth, I guess you could say, um, which is that he doesn't work with universities as partners, like a company like Coursera or edX does, to develop these courses that he's doing. He actually works with individual professors, but they're doing things kind of differently than um, a lot of the um, a lot of campus attempts, um, partly because they are outside of that space. And now I'm not endorsing um, what he's doing necessarily. It's just there are experiments going on that I think are off the radar of a lot of academic um, technology folks even. Um, and this approach to a psychology course that I took um, when I was working on a, an ebook that we did about MOOCs, I took a couple MOOCs all the way through to try to see what, what was really going on. And this one, I just kind of picked it because it was starting at the right time. And um, it was interesting because there are two professors from San Jose State University who are Gregory Feist and um, Susan Sin um, Sincerski. And together they have uh, 
uh, 25 and 15 years. So we're talking a lot of years together combined of teaching. And I think they even wrote a textbook. So these are, these are kind of leaders in like teaching in psychology intro. But the way Udacity had them teach their class was they involved um, another person who was a master's student who had just graduated with them, Lauren Castellano. And if you watch the videos, the three of them all appear but Lauren, the younger one there, is the one who actually appears on almost all the videos, and she is kind of the face of the, of the videos. And she is an, a Udacity employee now. She got hired there. And she is the person working with a team at Udacity that's basically writing scripts and designing this, these courses kind of like a Hollywood production. And the professors are involved in the curriculum creation and all the scripts writing, but they're kind of, they're, they're taken aside, I mean, it's kind of taken away from them too because they're busy at San Jose State teaching their regular classes. And it's kind of tried to be optimized for this format. And everything is very modular. So each one of those little squares as you go through the video is actually like a separate piece of video that they can swap in and out. And so a lot of the video pieces are actually just voice over to a screencast. And they, they update them, not because Psychology 101 is changing very often, because it's a good old topic there that probably doesn't need to be updated as much as, say, a technology class. But they, um, they can swap them in and out based on the data they're seeing from these tens of thousands of students as they run the class again and again, of like what's working, what's kind of falling flat based on the clicks and the test scores inside the system. And so they're trying things and really kind of looking at it in a diff different way. Um, so this is, this is something that um, my uh, attempt at, at doing a visualization, it's not scientific on the size of, or, or placement here. But I do want to spend a couple minutes on, uh, this is kind of me trying to figure out what this landscape is looking like. I, I'm arguing that there's kind of this new learning landscape out there um, that is part of what's happening, why this moment is different. Um, and what I think this learning landscape, what I mean by that is these companies, some of these you've probably heard of, D2L, like Desire to Learn, they're a course management company. They've been around for a while. They're sort of a Blackboard competitor, so, um, and, or Canvas, I think you guys might have. So they're, they're that, and that, they've been getting a lot of funding lately. They're trying, they're getting involved with some of these um, massive online courses. So they're kind of this traditional selling a product to a college, to a campus. That's what people are used to. Echo 360 does lecture capture. So these are some of the, oh, by the way, these, these are the top 10 best funded startups to, uh, uh, based on the end of last year. Um, so these are the biggest, that's why I picked these 10 companies. But if you look at the 10 most well-funded ed tech startups in higher education, Newton is one of them, I mentioned that one early on. And um, they also pretty much right now, they work with traditional higher ed and traditional publishers selling to higher ed. Um, but since they work with a lot of publishers like Pearson, I sort of put them a little bit toward the uh, over the line outside of college. But the most of the action, most of the interest, and most of the money um, who, you know, th these folks in Silicon Valley, like I said, the, that I've talked to, yes, they, um, this kind of disruptor mentality, the, the playbook, oh, and I should say, I, I took a MOOC because I didn't understand all this business stuff, so I, I took a MOOC on understanding the entrepreneurial mindset um, from the University of Maryland's um, business school. And so, so now, I, I, now I know enough to, to do this talk. Um, <laughs> And what they told me in understanding the entrepreneurial mindset is that sometimes people come into this and they don't care what they're going to make a company about. But they're looking at these big trends about what's happening. And in, in education, um, you guys came up on their radar, right? It's like, for a while, healthcare, um, other things. But education is estimated at a, uh, I think it's, uh, I'll correct myself if I'm wrong on this, but I think it's a $4.3 trillion business globally in the next couple of years. So trillion, right? So there's like, the idea being that there's something going on and people should come into it. But the other truism and the, the thing about I mentioned about Sebastian Thrawn is there's, this, there's been this kind of like, oh, they're going to take over doing what colleges do. But I, I feel like more and more as I'm covering this, it's not even in their mind so much or even interest in a lot of ways to do exactly what you guys are doing. It's, it's, you guys are fine. I mean, you guys are going to be here. Um, and I think everyone kind of knows that now, especially after the sort of MOOC revolutionary talk and now... Uh, everyone's looking around and we're all still here. So um, the idea though is that something still is changing even if it's not some like one-on-one -on -one death match between college and Udacity. Um, so what is it? They're basically, in a way, they're kind of chasing different kinds of customers. They're learners, but they're not necessarily anybody that you're even courting um, at your university. Um, and in some ways, they're also pieces of learning software or learning tools. Chegg, for instance, 
is one of the, uh, it's the biggest balloon on here, 252 million. And by the way, just for context, Southwestern University, their entire endowment is that. So this is like real money, um, a lot of money, more money than in the past for these kinds of companies. Um, and so Chegg is, I think one of the reasons it's so big is because one of their services, they do a lot of textbook and rental, textbook rentals, but they don't want to be in the textbook business. It's a terrible business. It's dying. Um, it's kind of like journalism. Uh, <laughs> nervous laughter um, on my part. But, so, but Chegg's new business, they're an Uber for tutors. So Uber has got the biggest ball of money on the other chart. And you know, it's a place where students can go find other student tutors and pay what the market will bear, you know, depending on the busyness of the season. I mean, it's just like Uber, right? If, it's, if there's like a rainstorm, you're going to pay double. And if it's finals time, you're going to pay double on their Uber for tutors. Um, but it's obviously, you guys set up a great tutoring center at your universities, but the idea is there's, they, they feel like there's a market for people, to students to pay for it anyway because of something they feel like they're going to offer that, that isn't being offered in the traditional higher ed. And, and a lot of times the students, I've, I've interviewed some of these Uber for tutors, and it's not all people within higher education. A lot of the people they're tutoring are people taking MOOCs um, that are not part of colleges. So if, you know, it's not necessarily this one-on-one -on -one game. And um, the ones I, I painted yellow um, in the program are all ones that offer courses on their own right. Uh, so they don't, they don't need you. They're offering their own courses. Coursera, of course, is right in the middle. They partner with traditional colleges and they offer the courses, but they offer their own kind of micro degrees these days, right? Their own credential, which is not part of the accredited system that we know and love. It's kind of this made up degree that they declared. And so you can have a, it's not, a, it's not as long as to get as a master's and therefore not as expensive. And it's not as short as one course or some thing you took at the extension school. So it's this, it's this middle thing that you can take online and they're splitting the revenue 50-50. So they're right there in the middle of this new old space. And, um, and Udacity you know, made the cut. Um, Minerva is an entire university started in Silicon Valley, but they're, right now they're not accredited and they're, they're basically doing it. They're trying to create an elite you know, selective university from scratch as if they didn't have any of the, of the legacy systems uh, and, you know, uh, uh, professors and buildings that, that you guys, that any university would have. And so um, basically there's a lot of energy moving off into the outsider's world as far as the money in this, in this world. And there's this, so it goes back to this new learning landscape is because when these things that are happening in the classroom around adaptive learning and flipped classroom, when these, when these systems and, and platforms are being built, again, these are almost all of those companies could be defined as a platform. And they're all collecting incredible sets of data, right? Like Coursera, working with over 100 university partners, might be up to 200, is, is, ha, knows more than any one individual campus about the teaching and learning that's going on. And same for Udacity or for Minerva, when they're doing mass teaching or even um, when they're reaching different kinds of students and really analyzing it in this new data-driven way. And so because of the, the new kind of learning style and things being in the cloud and things more being digital and less reliant on the, the traditional ways of like analog like right now me. Um, so that is what's created this kind of um, bullseye within education and learning for, um, for, for, this, for these companies. So, um, so, okay, so in the time I've left, I hope by now I've convinced you that something is, so something happening here. Um, and what it is is not exactly clear. So we've got the unicorn and the tower, um, and I think they should learn more about each other, be more contact with each other, understand each other's mindsets a little more, um, know that it's more than just these tropes that are said about each other, that you know, maybe money is the way it's keeping score in Silicon Valley, but it's not the only reason these people I talked to are doing it. They could have picked another uh, field. And, and a lot of them actually, um, like Sebastian Thron, has been a professor entire career. He's not like somebody completely on the outside coming in. He admits that you know the, the maybe he's new to making a company that's going to compete with university or that's going to sorry do university type things. And in the and the university, of course, meanwhile, you've never been a totally isolated ivory tower. But even more so, there's this need to be um, connected or, or at least aware. So I have five kind of. Five kind of pieces of advice. Now, of course, it's easier for a journalist to just uh, monitor and track what's happening than it is to 
uh, predict the future or offer advice, but bear with me. I have five kind of things that I think are worth thinking about as this moment happens. And one is to be more open to the outsiders. Um, because I know from the, the from the quip that I put up there earlier about, you know, and the snake oil accusations. And, and that is, is there, and there's always, you know, it's always a need for skepticism, as I've got to, but, um, but th at the same time, I feel like there is a bit of a blind spot at a lot of even education technology folks that I talk to about what's happening at places like Pluralsight, which is another one of those giant orbs that I didn't describe much. But Pluralsight has no connection to higher education. A lot of people haven't even heard of them. Has anyone heard of Pluralsight? So it's one of the largest, you know, it has some of the most backing of any ed tech company right now. It's kind of like a lynda.com, which people might be more familiar with. It does like these video-based courses. And it's, it's about like kind of up, uh, um, increasing your skills as a working adult. And so, it, it, and they're not accredited and they're not, they're not trying to be. They're not, they're not asking for um, federal funding for financial aid. They're sort of off the radar. But they're spending a lot of this, this investment money on experimentation with teaching. And you guys could learn from them. There's, there's, you guys are so good inside the academy of sharing with each other, having meetings like this, sharing with each other on campus, sharing with each other across campuses. Um, and there are ways in which this has happened automatically in the culture of higher education, right? Because it's a sharing world. You're all nonprofits. Um, you're, you're kind of in this culture of publishing and sharing. But I, it's not necessarily the case as much that Udacity is really jumping to give away their secrets. But I'll be there in the Chronicle and other newspapers are there and magazines writing about them. And there are plenty of ways like going on the courses yourself and looking at them and trying to kind of see what they're doing and maybe learn from what they're up to. Um, now, um, some of the outsiders, I'm just going to share one quick lesson, which um, this is Nick Walter. Um, and so I did mention, and I didn't want to leave it out completely, that, that you know, if... if EdTech um, startup folks are from Mars and professors are from Venus and students are a whole other thing, right? So the other, one of the things about these EdTech entrepreneurs is often they're right out of school. And the problem they understand is higher education because that's what they just finished doing. And so they're going to apply their, uh, and they saw the, the numbers chart that I mentioned. So they're interested, genuinely interested, they've just gone through it. And so Nick Walter is somebody who's using a platform called Udemy. Um, He's a recent graduate of Brigham Young University. He was in the you know, information science. He wanted to decide he was going to make a company, maybe start up being one of these startups. But he actually figured out he could actually make more money teaching online than he could as, a, as making even an app, which sounds kind of counterintuitive to people that are not rich inside of higher education. But what he did was he was looking at a, this platform, Udemy, which is actually another one of the biggest, most funded startups these days. And it actually is a platform where anyone can teach. Um, you go to their site and they're basically like, you can teach. And it's not necessarily anybody with a degree in, or, uh, or a teacher. And, so it's, and, and you can make money. Um, so this is one of those, like, you can um, set up a course easily and then split the revenue with, with Udemy. So just like Amazon, if, I, if any of you guys could publish a book right now, compete with me, it's fine, on Amazon. And you'll get, you know, if you do it, you can self-publish it and take 70% of the revenue and Amazon will take 30 and that's not a bad deal. And Udemy is the same idea where you get your cut and they get their cut and you can teach today. Um, and they really emphasize the zero teaching experience. And a lot of professors I talk to, and so Nick Walter is the epitome of this rogue professor, right? He's, um, he decided he was gonna teach a class in how to make apps. He had just learned that and he even admitted to me he's not a very good student himself. But he thought nonetheless that he had something to offer. And this is one of his uh, goofy videos that he made to compel people to take his class. And he is all in your face about how he's not a teacher. Um, he's dancing to techno music that I think he wrote. He's, good, you know, he's kind of like, I, you do not need to know anything. And, you know, and neither do I. And it's this really interesting thing where you're looking at, and you know, like, what is this student doing trying to get, and the thing is, it worked. Like, he got tons of students. He actually makes his living doing this in his, uh, the, the group sh house he shares with the four other people in, U in Provo, Utah. He hired a videographer with some of his money that he's getting from these courses. And, and basically he spends the morning making new videos from his couch uh, or his living room. Um, and then he spends the afternoon answering student questions and doing things. So I know a lot of people, he's like the most dismissible example I could give because he's telling you he doesn't care about, he doesn't know about teaching and he's doing it. But 
I think that his, his message, and he's earned that much, like it's a lot. And he's very interesting. He actually has this podcast. His goal for the year is to make a million dollars. And I asked him, like, why a million dollars? Um, he just, that's like keeping score. That's just, because cause that's more than the other guys. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing about him, though, is he is genuine. He does work hard from my talks with him. And he does care, actually, that the students are learning. And the, one of the points he makes is that his advantage is that he doesn't use jargon, that he actually says he had trouble learning the, the technology. That's why he wasn't a good student. And then he really was discouraged by all the, you know, Boolean this and, you know, kind of JavaScript that. And when he was trying to start learning apps, he just had, like, an idea for an app. He just wanted to build the app. And he did not see himself as a computer nerd. And so he basically is trying to create a class that he wished he could have. And so that's reason for his approach. And the other thing that even Steven Pinker in his article, Advice to Academic writing, Writers, is that one thing professors that have a PhD and that are far out of school forget is the excitement of when it's just right new. And it's just the thing you just figured out that day. And the, he has that still. Because he did just, I mean, I don't know how long he can keep that energy up, right? But um, th this is his selling point, is that he is so new and he's going to teach you based on this, like, you know what, it, it's, it, I'm able to figure it out. If I can do it, I'm going to help you do it. So that kind of spirit is something to think about. Um, again, it's not the only lesson. And maybe there's lessons you can count. You know, maybe we should avoid, you know, maybe there's things you can learn of what not to do. So he's failing for you then. Um, so Sebastian Thrun, who is also one of the developers of Google Glass, which really went well, um, <laughs> but Sebastian Thrun spoke at a conference. The um, Sloan, uh, you know, has this big conference. It just happened a couple. Uh, some of you might have been there, right? The Sloan Annual Teaching and Learning Online Learning Conference, and he was the keynote, uh, 2012 or 2013. It was like the height of MOOCs. I think it was 2013, right? It's, now it seems like a long time ago. Um, and so he actually didn't wear Google Glass that day. That's a little bit of a just a full disclosure. But I thought this picture was better. Um, so he got up there, and he it was kind of Udacity was new, and he was sort of apologizing for that thing he said to Wired. Um, sorry, my bad, I didn't really mean to replace you guys. I love you guys. But he actually said some interesting things. He said that, you know, I, I've been a professor this whole time, but I haven't really been paying that much attention to teaching, but I want to learn. Teach me. And so, and he's like, you know, his company has a huge incentive to learn how to be um, the kind of things you guys know in this room and might take for granted and have developed years and years over time in the classroom. The hard one knowledge. And so he was there basically saying, I don't, I don't know. I'm not pretending to know. A lot of people that I talked to in the room were very critical of this and him. And just was like, oh, this clown. Um, and it doesn't help if he does the days he does wear Google Glass. But, but there is this, you know, there's this moment where you know, they, are, they are reading your published papers about teaching, believe it or not. Some of the most avid readers of this material is Sebastian Thrun and people who run Coursera. And I, every time I talk to Anand Agarwal from edX, he's like telling me about some article he just read in a referee journal about teaching. So they are, because they're trying to, you know, hoover up all the information and then do it better or do it differently. Um, and so that's, so even though I, I'm encouraging openness and it's starting to sound like I'm endorsing these companies, which I'm absolutely not, um, because we, we don't have, uh, that, you know, our role is to be a watchdog and to be outside of the academy. But, so please be skeptical. And you have need to look no further than the recent headlines about University of Florida Online, which just last week canceled its contract with Pearson to develop something that was a um, $35 million uh, effort to try to set up this online wing of the University of Florida. And they partnered with Pearson, which is an enabler. Oh, and I, of course, I neglected the blue dot on my previous slide is this another oddity within this ed tech space right now and, and the vendor space is 2U and Pearson's, um, which bought Embanet, but this enabler, the enablers, um, which is a strange category we're still trying to, to, to give uh, more work on and, and we're watching it closely. We're foying the documents. We're looking into what's going on because it's a strange system where a university, and many of them are selective universities we've heard of, famous universities, old fashioned, good old universities, partnering with 2U and these enablers to the, create fully online degree programs. And there's there, there whole degrees you can get these things. And they're, they're full price a lot of times. They're not like a free, cheap, open thing. And the idea is the university, the college may not have the money to put up right away to get it, especially if it's a state college. Um, so 2U will actually invest in it with millions of dollars. And then they get, in some cases, most of the revenue for the first few years. So it's this strange 
a relationship I've never seen before within the academy for around teaching. I mean, this might happen in dining services, fine. Um, but this is a new thing that's happening. And so in, in the University of Florida system, it went wrong. And the, what they did was they had, um, they had some unicorn projections. They had these really big promises of how many out-of-state students they would get in the first few years, which did not happen. And the in-state students were charged very uh, reasonable rates, quite small, and that's who showed up. And then the, um, the legislature really wanted them to charge a lot for the out-of-state students, because they're out-of-state. But nobody out of state wanted to pay all that money when there were plenty of other options. So the enrollments out of state were dismal. And that's where the money was all, all of the money was coming from that and all the dreamy projections. And so another, I think there was a little bit of a, now of course, believe me, I talked to faculty members who were like, we knew all along this was a terrible idea. And we interviewed those people. But um, there were plenty of well-meaning people all around who signed the deal, smart people who um, I think were a little taken in by, well, this business knows how to do it. Businesses, they, they know how to do it. They talk these investors into giving all this money. They must know what they're doing. And so there's a little bit, there can be a little too much of the they must know what they're doing. So it's this, it's this balance between watching when the money is spent, why not watch how it goes, um, and then learning from it when it works and when it doesn't work. So it's not all gonna work. And then embrace the ecosystem. Um, professors are now being sold to more directly by ed tech companies. This is a company called Piazza, which people might have heard of, but it's just an example. It's a, a, again, a person who was recently a student who's the founder. Um, and so this, this founder, when I've interviewed her, is very, you know, really doesn't want to work with, um, like, no offense to the people working at the, the colleges trying to buy licenses, but she's, she felt like individual faculty is more where she wanted to go. And so the, they don't even have, like, I don't believe, maybe they have changed it, but they didn't have an enterprise solution at all. And so the idea was you had to work as a professor can adopt it, and that they hoped that, that this kind of word of mouth would help have, and this is a forums kind of, they just focus on doing online forums which for a lot of hybrid and online classes is something that, that goes on. And they're trying to use the latest of like, you know, voting up good comments by students or voting down, it's just to really focus on this one thing. And there are a lot of one things out there now. And as professor, it can be kind of dizzying. So I will take a quick plug for Prof Hacker, which the Chronicle of Higher Ed is involved with. Um, you can find them on our site. And they have things every day, every week, um, go to chronicle.com, Prof Hacker. They, of like, sometimes the headlines are a little bit hard. Some, it's like, Make your syllabus better with PicoChart. And I'm like, or PictoChart. I'm, and PictoChart? You're like, sometimes it feels like alphabet soup because some of these names are terrible. But, um, but actually, I, just for fun, you know, I, did, I do teach this class on the side. And so I try to practice what I preach occasionally. And so I went to PictoChart and used it to try to make some of my syllabus. That's pretty slick, actually. Um, and actually, the balls, that little graphic I made for this presentation I made on PictoChart and then just grabbed it off. So it wasn't really what they wanted me to use it for. But I just hacked it so I could build the, the, the different, because I was like, I just need to do this quickly. And so there are tools, they're getting easier to use for, um, you know, if you just have a few minutes and you want to make your class better, because let's face it, that's, that's what often happens. Um, and so this, there's an interesting ecosystem that you can go to even if, even without the help of your teaching with tech staff, although maybe they would then um, roll their eyes when I say that. Um, so we could talk about that after. Um, and then the, the fourth thing I wanted to mention of my five, and I, I am almost done, is to sweat the data details, especially when you are as a university making arrangements with these companies. Because as I mentioned, these are unprecedented troves of data. And maybe there are gonna be incredible lessons in there but maybe they're never gonna be published in a peer-reviewed journal if a company has them. Maybe, I don't know, it depends on how the contracts are written, it depends on how forceful colleges can be in um, advocating for those kinds of um, uh, transparency, and it also depends on um, something that's kind of boring for me to write about but are actually probably important, which are open standards. Um, there's a caliper learning standard that just came out by the IMS, um, global standards body, which I'm really interested in and would love to talk more with folks about this here because it's about learning analytics. It's a data standard for learning analytics. And only a few companies are, you know, just came out. But if something happened where there'd be a standard where data could be transportable, as it has in some other parts of our world as we've moved to the cloud, um, then that might be a big win for colleges, scholars being able to study this and actually publishing it out or um, other ways for people to learn from this, these data sets. 
And that's going to be, or you know, it, become, it could become a, an era where one of these companies becomes like a Facebook as far as their power and their, and their heft. And that now you see Facebook, I mean, people like the Chronicle, we have a Facebook page like everyone else in, in media. And we, you know, it drives a lot of traffic, but we're at their mercy in, that, in some ways because we're more, you know, more and more media is experimenting with being there. And that's not always where you want to be. So um, I, the last fifth and final point is this idea of professors, obviously, in the end, no matter what the buzzwords or even if it's actually pretty clearly stated by a tech company, you still have to make it your own. And no amount of buzzwords is going gonna, is gonna to bring it home to each individual professor, probably until they've tried it. And so let me, if, if the tech um, gods cooperate, I'm going to show you this video, if I can. Um, is there any way to raise the volume on what we're seeing? Oh, what I'm seeing on my screen, which no one else can see. Um, could, could I have the projector? Of, oh, there it is. OK, so if the sound works, I'm going to play this clip from Michael Wesch, who, if you haven't heard from him, uh, he, he's a really interesting character that I'll tell you about in a minute. But um, this is a video he made just recently, if I can get it to play. OK, please play. OK, this is not comic. All right, so this, this is our uh, main word of the uh, Hear it. Okay, I've lost control of this thing, so there we go. Is there is there a way to get this on the screen? Or do I have to do it? Um, My apologies, everybody. I'm using this machine and not my own. I just want to be able to play these videos. Um, did you switch? Oh, I thought it was all this. Where's your Well, let me just describe this really quickly. I don't want to, because I know we're at the end of time, and I, I wanted to have a little bit of time for questions. But he, so he has, um, he, Michael Wesch is, is one of the things he recently was interested in was competency-based education, which I mentioned as a buzzword. And so, you know, what is what does that mean to do it if your if your class that you have assigned your job is to teach anthropology intro class? And so what he did was he wanted to make um, his syllabus um, mapped to competency-based. You know, this is all like buzzword stuff, like the map to competencies, so that you're not just learning like ideas for a class, but that you're learning, um, you know, something bigger that even if you don't care about anthropology, these are life lessons. And so his intro anthropology class actually lends itself pretty well to that kind of approach. But he basically like wrote out, he, he said he used to always just list the syllabus would be like the way the textbook does it, which is kind of like, you know, this country, global culture, this, and you know, it's very much like a, um, it just kind of lists very jargony things about anthropology, and by the time you get through it, you know the jargon of anthropology. But instead, what he did was he basically, it almost sounds like an Apple ad. He's basically like, you know, understand the other, and, and you know, culture is different, and life is shaped by culture. And so he just had these 10 things that he wanted people to learn throughout the, or nine things. And then he just had these, uh, he made a video that's kind of like a viral video of, that he set along to his, it's almost like poetry, he just reads these nine things he expects people to learn. And I'll put the link up to, to, to people to watch it. And so the idea is like, you watch it and you don't even think it's a syllabus. It, it kind of sneaks up on you. You don't even realize that you just heard nine things you'll learn in this class. But the idea is that because it maps to like things you want to do as a human, like the fact that culture is a construct and that we want to understand each other. And, that, and so the idea being that um, he figured out a way to kind of take this buzzword and make it something that, that he could use and that made sense to him. And I feel like we're going to see that in classroom after classroom as people um, 
hopefully understand some of what's going on, understand the power of working with teams to build new kinds of courses, and to figure out a way that goes to the, and, and actually builds on the experience of teaching for 40 years or teaching for how many years people have been doing it, and that building on that knowledge, and that's what you guys have to bring, and maybe learning from the upstarts who just started. So that's all I have, and I welcome a question or two. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs>